Praise be Jesus and Mary. Today we celebrate throughout the Catholic world this solemnity of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. In this celebration in the readings and the prayers really uh, tends to bring to the forefront what St. Paul calls the mystery of iniquity. The mystery, I mean, look at the players that we have in today's readings, right? We have Satan, we have uh, the Archangel Gabriel, Our Lady the Immaculate, full of grace. Now we have all of this going on. The first reading from the book of Genesis uh, makes mention of the serpent, okay? He is the original rebel, as he's sometimes called. The one who was first to disobey, uh, not being tempted by anyone else, but just by his own perverse will, chose to disobey God. And then he, in turn, convinced what is traditionally understood a third of the stars, that is, a third of the other angels, to follow in his rebellion. Okay? Under his influence, now, they were all responsible themselves, having free will, uh, but nevertheless, they were under the influence, temptation, and bad example of that original rebel. Now, it can be said that St. Michael, the archangel, and the other two-thirds stood firm. Okay, they stood firm and probably under the leadership and guidance of St. Michael himself, who encouraged them to stand their ground. Don't move, don't budge. This is the place to be in the service and obedience of Almighty God. So then we have the human race, again, as recounted here in the first reading, and the original rebel is trying to get uh, the original man to rebel with him as well, and he succeeds. You see, this brings so much disaster, so much darkness, so much suffering, so much death. This is the world that the human race will be living in, okay, for the rest of the time of this world's existence, okay? And really, we could say, traditionally speaking, contrary to that of the angels, it is the majority of the human race rather than the minority, like in the case of the angels, right? That are falling, uh, have fallen, will fall, and there are scriptural reasons for this as well. You know, the book of Revelation chapter 12 talks about the fall of the angels, right? A third of the stars are swept away by the tail of the dragon. Well, it's the prophet Zechariah chapter 13, where he says, in the whole land, says the Lord, two thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is my God. So that's a scriptural reference that kind of contraposes uh, the scenario that we have with the angels. Now, uh, the number of angels is also interesting to meditate on and contemplate because we, we have just a beautiful represent, representation of all of these spiritual realities in the physical world. Right? The sun representing God or our Lord Jesus Christ. The moon, the immaculate, reflecting all of the brightness of the sun represents Our Lady. In the stars, as Revelation chapter 12 explains, representing the angels. Now think about how many angels there are. Well, the theologians say that um, the number of angels most likely far surpasses the number of human beings. Okay, because the number of human beings, each of us will have uh, one angel alone assigned to us as our guardian. So... And this is kind of, again, depicted in the physical universe too, right? How many stars are there? 
I, I looked this up just a little while ago. How many stars are there? They say uh, not a billion, not a trillion, not a hundred trillion. But they say there are a hundred billion trillion in, our, in the observable universe. Okay, that's a, again, not a bad physical depiction of what may be uh, the same number of angels out there. So in all of this drama, Our Lady appears on the scene in what we, in the scripture calls the fullness of time, right? So throughout the whole Old Testament and, and the ancient times, the light amidst all of this darkness was the light of hope, right? That's what they had. They had God's promises, Okay, that I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will strike at your head while you strike at her heel. Another translation, he, she, they will crush your head and you will strike at their heel. So it's the promise that gives everyone hope. So it's not despair, right? That would be utter and complete darkness if there were no promise of a savior, so the light that precedes the actual coming is hope, okay? Which is not a bad thing. They're hanging on to something. And God, of course, is faithful. So, but here we have when Our Lady actually arrives on the scene, the Immaculate Conception, now we have real light coming into the world. Okay, we have somebody who Satan has nothing to do with. Okay? He has no um, possession of her whatsoever. She is immaculate, without stain, shining bright and full of grace. So now the human race and the world, there is real light that has come into it. And then, of course, she will be the one who bears the Savior of the world, the true light, right? Our Lady is, she magnifies the Lord. She magnifies uh, Christ, who is the true light. So just as the moon reflecting uh, the light of the sun and receives its light, all of its light from the sun, so Our Lady has received everything who she is uh, and possesses from the Lord, right? The Lord has done, done great things in me. As we said in today's responsorial psalm, uh, for he has done marvelous things. He has done marvelous things in the Blessed Virgin Mary. So this is the light. Our Lady is that uh, bright dawn which announces the coming. The Immaculate Conception is the bright dawn that announces the coming of the Son of Justice. So now, you know, we live in uh, post-redemption times, if we want to call it that, right? The Savior has come. The church has been established. We have the sacraments. We have the Eucharist. And we have all these things. We have the fullness of the truth and all of this. This is great. You know, we have true light, Certain hope of salvation, if we persevere and correspond, okay, we still need to do that. Um, but at the same time, um, the devil is given a certain amount of time, right? God is still given his time. We're waiting for the second coming. And so darkness is still present in this world, and quite a bit of darkness, okay? This is what we find ourselves in. This is the reality, and so we never want to lose sight of these truths because living in the world, of course, we can tend to get uh, caught up in temporal matters. We can tend to get caught up in politics, in unjust laws, in scandals and sin even within the church itself, right? Let's not, uh, you know, fall into despair or uh, lose faith or anything like that, but we really need to always stay close to our Lord and to our Lady, right? This is the message of the saints throughout the ages. This is the message of the church 
throughout the ages. The Eucharist, the Rosary, Our Lord, Our Lady, this is the winning camp. We know this. And so we need to stay always close to them. Humility, obedience, faith, and hope, and charity, and confidence, okay? Uh, so that we can do our part with Our Lady's help uh, of bringing some light into this world of darkness, okay? And uh, we bring as many as we can along with us to Our Lady so that she can bring them to our Lord. Um, and then our hope, of course, is always in the second coming of Christ when final justice will be established uh, and all of the trials and difficulties and tears will be over. Okay, so stay close to Our Lady. She's the Immaculate Conception, the patroness of our country, who certainly has her gaze, her eyes, her care uh, on us. And uh, uh, so let's do that. Always stay close to her. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.